So thanks very much for the invitation to present today. Um, so like Andrew said, I'm going to be talking about a study that we've conducted with support from the Autism CRC, um, well, that we're still conducting, but the preliminary parts are ready to discuss, um, looking at preemptive therapy. I thought I would actually start, though, just with a quick um, overview of my place in the autism community, just for context. Um, so I'm an autism researcher. I'm not autistic. I'm not a parent of children with autism. Um, in fact, I'm not a parent at all. So just um, so that people have that context in mind when interpreting or, or thinking about how I interpret things. Um, but I am an autism researcher and I've been working in this space for a long time. Um, and my interests are really around these sorts of questions. So understanding how autism presents early in life and so how it emerges and also importantly, how outcomes are optimised for children and families both, including through early support, early intervention. Um, I've been a member for a long time of the International Society for Autism Research. So I'm um, attending annual conferences overseas getting to really know um, other autism researchers who are working in this space and, and other spaces. Um, I had the real opportunity um, about 10 years ago to spend five years in the UK working as part of two large projects, the ASIS team and the Preschool Autism Communication Trial team which have relevance to what I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, I've also held positions with the Olga Tennyson Autism Research Centre and the Victorian ASELC on campus at La Trobe University in the past. And I continue to be employed at La Trobe University um, where we've conducted the ACES trial with CRC support, which I'm going to talk about today. So just for some background. So jumping straight into the ACES trial, um, like Andrew said, the question for us um, as researchers and as practitioners um, seeking to support um, young children with autism and their families was why should we wait until a child has a diagnosis, has potentially gone through a long process to get a diagnosis before we might do something about that to um, help support their outcomes. And if we get in preemptively, so in the early years before that child's diagnosis is determined, there's the potential we think to really make a substantial improvement improvement on outcomes rather than, than waiting and, and um, for potentially months or years until the child's diagnosis is confirmed. But in order for us to have a good stab at this preemptive intervention or support, it requires two things. Firstly, an efficacious intervention. So something that has kind of proof of concept that it's going to be helpful and also an accurate ability to identify children early who stand to benefit from support. And so really excitingly, I think for us about um, five years ago, these two kind of planets aligned, if you like. Um, so Jonathan Green, who's a colleague of ours in the UK, published a paper on an intervention which is called um, rather clunkily iBasis FIP. So um, I'll use the little basis logo to flag that one. Um, so this is an intervention that showed promise for helping parents um, with young infants who might develop autism to support their infant's development. And then locally here in Australia, um, many of you I'm sure will be aware of Josie Barbaro's work on the social attention and communication surveillance tool, the SACS. Um, and so this is uh, a method for identifying infants early in life who might be developing autism before that point of diagnosis. And um, recently in 2018, Josie's presented some really strong data about that, um, the, the positive predictive value of that tool for really identifying kids from 12 months of life who were probably going to have a diagnosis a couple of years later. Um, so with these two planets aligning, like I said, we launched the ACES trial. And um, what we've done for ACES is sought to test this hypothesis that among nine to 14 month olds, so if we recruit really young kids with early signs of autism, a short, a relatively short amount of intervention, so six months of this iBasis FIP intervention would hypothetically improve parent-child interaction quality improve infant developmental and language skills and reduce the extent of those early emerging behaviours um, that might head a child towards an autism diagnosis. So um, we launched the ACES trial. This is a full-scale efficacy trial with two sites. So our site that I lead in Perth, in, in Melbourne, and the site that Andrew leads in Perth, um, and also in collaboration with um, colleagues in the UK. It's a two-arm trial, which effectively means that children are randomly allocated into one of two groups, a group who receive the intervention and a group who continue with services as usual in the community. And it's a single blind randomised controlled trial, which means that the assessors who conduct the outcome of evaluations of the children don't know whether the children and families did or didn't get the treatment. Um, ideally, in randomised controlled trial worlds, we'd also have a double blind trial, but because these are parent mediated interventions, we can't not have parents know whether they're getting intervention or not. So we've gone with a single blind trial. 
um, our trial design looks a bit more like this. So we had children at our two sites. Um, I'll get my little laser pointer up if I can work it out. Here we go. Um, so children in, in Melbourne and in Perth um, identified on the basis of the SACS checklist and referred to our team, um, at which point we did a baseline assessment and the children were randomised into one of these two arms. So to get the eye basis intervention or to continue with services as usual, following which we assess them again. And then we have some follow-ups, which I'll talk about in a moment as well. Um, the timeline for this uh, longitudinal research takes time. We have to wait for kids to grow up before we can sort of see how things have gone. So we started this trial back in 2016 and we're just at the point, at the kind of pointy end, shall we say, of the trial now, which is exciting. Um, but what I'm going to present to you today is really about this middle part here, our baseline assessment for the cohort, the intervention, and then the outcome immediately following the receipt of that intervention. So the participants, this is, um, if you like, uh, the, the plan for the trial, and this is how the trial actually unfolded. So we did screen 170 families for eligibility. Some were not um, eligible, but 104 families were engaged and randomised in the trial, roughly half receiving the intervention and roughly half of families receiving community services as usual. And what was great from our perspective is we, we managed to have all of those families, or almost all of them, stick it through with us and, and come back six months later um, for those outcome assessments assessments, which is fantastic. Um, the participants um, at the start of the trial, so not surprisingly, perhaps were mostly boys. Um, there was a large uh, subgroup of families who already had autism in the family, so had a, an older child who was already diagnosed, and then the participant child in the study was the younger sibling of that child. And children, like I said, were on average 12 months at the start of their time with us, um, but ranging between 9 and 14 months in each group. Uh, families were, were mixed and diverse, uh, mostly mothers participating, but not exclusively, and mostly well-educated, but again, not exclusively. Um, very briefly on the therapy, but I'm certainly not the most qualified to actually talk about what's involved in the therapy delivery. Um, so like, like I said, we're focusing here really on the part in between the baseline assessment, the therapy that was received by half of the families, and then I'll talk about the outcome assessments as well. But briefly, the iBasis FIP therapy is an in-home therapy um, series of 10 sessions fortnightly. Um, where the parent and the infant and the ACES therapist work together. Um, what actually happens during sessions is that the therapist starts by filming some parent-child interaction. This might be free play, it might be some snack or some other sort of slightly more structured activities. Um, and then the parent and therapist together review the footage from the previous session and the therapist can guide the parent to reflect on aspects of the infant's behaviour and the parent's own behaviour. And the idea here is to try to highlight emerging infant skills. Um, so helping the parent to review the video and, and see things in their infant that they might not notice, you know, in real life with all the busyness of what's going on. Um, so to highlight the infant's emerging social communication skills and thereby to support the parent to um, gain insight into what they can do to, to continue to facilitate those. And then parents, of course, were given homework to do in between sessions. So in terms of the measurement, and again, here we're talking about that baseline assessment, and then again, straight after the end of treatment for the families who got the treatment, um, we're measuring three broad categories of things. So parent-child interaction quality using a measure called the MACI. This is a rating scale which captures things like how sensitively parents respond to their infant and also infant positivity and liveliness in the interaction. Um, we use two standardised assessments, so the Mullen Scales of Early Learning is a direct assessment um, delivered by an examiner with the child to test uh, visual spatial skills, fine motor skills and language abilities. And the Vineland is a, a parent um, interview or survey, um, again tapping lots of different aspects of that child's development, including social skills and communication and language skills. Um, and then finally, we did our um, standardised uh, assessment of um, those emerging autism behaviours. So again, this is an administer assessment task with the infant to try and tap the infant's emerging social skills, things that we think might be telling us that an infant may be developing autism. So lots of different measures here, but our approach is really to try to cast a, a reasonably broad net to see whether we could get a sense of how this early preemptive intervention might be helpful for infants and their parents early on. Um, and now I will take you through the results, which are complicated, but bear with me. So if you again remember our hypotheses, we were predicting that we would see a decrease in early autism behaviours and an increase in parent-child interaction quality and assessed infant skills um, for those infants who received the iBasis FIP intervention compared to those infants in the community services as usual group. 
I'm going to show you the results and there's a lot here, um, but I just want to explain it briefly and then I'll step you through the various parts. So this um, I've recently learned is called a forest plot and this is a way of summarising lots of different results over a trial. So all of these down the side here are our various measures and I will step you through these one at a time in a minute. What we see in the middle, um, the dotted line represents no change, so that a child or a group of children's scores at the end of something were the same as at the start. So um, dotted line is no change at all. Any sort of scores that are in this direction are favouring the group who received the intervention in our case. So suggesting that kids who got the intervention ended up doing better at the end than the kids who were in the community services or treatment as usual group. And then the reverse for things on this side here. So that's a forest plot. The dots tell you kind of the, for those who are interested, the kind of estimate of the effect. And then this line on either side tells you kind of how confident we can be. I think um, statistics and research are not an exact science. It's all about probabilities. And so hopefully that um, helps put some context around that. So these are the results. This is what we found for the children immediately after finishing the intervention when they were aged around 18 months. And firstly, what we're not seeing is our hypothesized reduction in early autism behaviors. So, you know, the little dot is on one side of our dotted line here, but the confidence is, is going on both sides of the line. So it's suggesting to us that there's no um, confident change in early autism behaviors as a result of this interventional support. Same thing in terms of parent-child interaction quality. So all of these data points are kind of spanning that, that no change line, which suggests that the intervention from um, 12 months of age to 18 months of intervent age isn't markedly impacting parent-child interaction quality. And in terms of developmental skills, things get a little more complex. So the Mullen scales here are our direct assessment of child skills. And again, we're seeing much the same, no um, significant or substantial improvement in the children in one group versus the other. However, when we look at the panel down below, we're seeing something a bit different about communication and language skills. So if you have a look here at receptive vocabulary, expressive vocabulary, you can see that these dots are definitely in the favor of the intervention group. So what this is suggesting to us is the iBasis FIP intervention with these infants who are recruited because they're showing early signs of autism is potentially having an impact in improving their early emerging social communication and language skills. So there are lots of next steps. This is the first part to our research, which is really exciting, but there's still a lot of work to do, which is perhaps also even more exciting. Um, we're going to obviously follow the children up to ages two and three. This was always part of our protocol and our plan, um, which was to see the infants early at 12 months, 18 months, trial the intervention in that time period here, and then keep following all the infants up to roughly two and three years of age. And the great news for our team is that we actually finished doing this in February of this year, and we're just processing all the data there's a lot of videos for us to look over and score. Um, there's a lot of data entry and checks to do, and then we're going to hand our data set over to the statistician, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, um, and they can uh, have a look at the numbers for us, and we'll have something to share later this year. Um, the other things that we're wanting to do is really leverage the huge resource of really rich parent-child interaction footage from this cohort and do some extra observations of the children's emerging communication and language, because we're seeing that potentially interesting benefit of communication and language from this intervention, we want to go in and actually listen to the children's emerging language during these parent-child interaction tapes and see what more we can understand about that from these kids. Um, we're also really excited that we've just got um, preliminary approval to aggregate our ACES trial data set with a similar data set that have been collected with a group um, in the US on another therapy called adaptive responsive teaching. And again, they've run a really great trial of ART with a community referred cohort. These are the only two trials like this that exist in the world. And we've got about 100 kids in our cohort, 100 kids in that one. There's a lot more that we can do and understand by pooling those together for a sample of 200 families with children showing early signs of autism who have um, gone through this longitudinal monitoring and intervention trial, um, which we think will be really beneficial for the field moving forward. And then finally, we've just started a new trial as well. This one's being run by Andrew and team and we're recruiting um, expectant parents into a new study um, where we're seeking to see whether this idea of providing support early on in life, rather than waiting until a child has a diagnosis could be really meaningful for families. So just to finish up, I want to acknowledge a huge team who are involved in this particular project, lots of financial support as well from um, different groups and in kind. Um, and this is, uh, this is the full team. And then this is just a small subgroup of us who managed to get together last year. Um, so by way of thanks to the team and thanks everyone for um, your interest. <laughs>